Yeah, welcome everyone to our talks, collaboratives, the first session of our three talks, collaboratives, where we will speak with different artists um, from dif different disciplines about their work specifically with other persons or with other uh, aliases as well um, from um, from all different uh, different perspectives on art as well and uh, talk about of course um, the uh, the idea how to work but also especially about the aesthetics that might change or evolve through this uh, approach of work today we have Natasha Diels and Paul Norman hello I'm glad you're here <laughs> and um, so before we talk, um, start talking, just a few things to everybody else. Um, as this is pre-recorded, um, if you would like to talk to the composers and artists later on, we have on Friday at 4 p.m. Central European time, we have a live a Zoom discussion. You can join us, you can ask questions there, or if you would like to, you can also write us an email in advance. The email uh, address is on this web page as well, where this video can be found. So please write us an email if you have questions or remarks to the artists. Not everybody, unfortunately, will be there, but Natasha and Paul will be there um, for this talk on Friday. And um, maybe to give you a short introduction of this idea, why we invited these people and what we're going to talk about, Michael has prepared a little yes. something. Yes. So please. Uh, we'd like to talk about artistic collaboration and collective creativity because on first sight uh, the concept of a jointly generated artistic creation uh, contradicts the traditional conception of an artist which is the creative subject which with uh, arcane and therefore un incommunicable ideas in musical context especially this model has remained largely uh, unchanged up to the present day the market still demands uh, a gifted individual or at least a creative mastermind at the head of hierarchically organized production processes. And the collective represents a completely different concept. Uh, here, the entire process, process of production and reception is substantially determined by the moment of communality. And the work of art as an individual achievement is pushed into the background by an ensemble. And we want to talk about those ensembles, about their structures and methods and today, Hannes mentioned it, our guests are Natasha Diels and Paul Norman. And before we start, uh, we want to introduce Natasha and Paul with a few words and two short films. And we start with Natasha Diels. Natasha's work combines ritual, combines ritual, improvisation, traditional instrumental practice, and cynical play to create worlds of curiosity and unease a musical approach contributes to the ongoing development of what she calls a new American experimentalism. Natasha founded the experimental music collective Ensemble Pomplemousse in 2003 and is its executive director and flutist since then. Uh, and now a short portfolio of Natasha's work.
Natasha, in my preparation, I repeatedly came across the term cynical or cynicism uh, with uh, regards to your artistic work. I don't know if this uh, term stems from you, but if so, <laughs> uh, how should one imagine a, a cynical music? Oh, um, I use that term um, to refer to the line that I like to walk between darkness and humor. Um, so I think in a lot of my pieces, I'm always kind of sort of winking a little bit at the audience, but also being kind of serious about my concepts, but always, you know, never doing it with total seriousness because it's like a laugh about it, cry about it kind of thing is where is the world that I like, like to kind of exist in. So you can kind of choose whether to laugh about it or cry about it, but I'm always kind of like, it's kind of funny, but kind of tragic, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's kind of what I mean by that. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it's coming up. I think, yeah, I'd, I would like to, to uh, I have a lot of questions, but I think we should go on and first introduce okay. the video by Paul and then okay. um, we go deeper into that um, yeah. discussion. Uh, Paul Norman uh, holds a PhD in composition from Royal Birmingham uh, Conservatory, where he is teaching up to now. Is that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure of it. it yeah. And I read a very beautiful description of how Paul defines his work as a composer that he just quoted. Uh, composing, he says, is a way of trying to understand little bits of the world and a way to point at the situations uh, I find intriguing in such a way that I can share that intrigue with others, end of quote. And so uh, let's be intrigued by a short film of, on Paul's work compiled by Hannes.
Do you think only because this one is about Shakespeare and has more proper funding you get to cut the music? Fuck off. I'm leaving. Inhale, and with the exhale, bend the knees until the palm rests onto the piano. <laughs> Hold it. Monster. India. Montenegro. Indonesia. Mongolia. Iran. Iraq. Monaco. <laughs> Thank you for putting that together. Yeah, Thank well, you're welcome. Thank you for, for the um, uh, material. It was a lot of fun, actually, to compose all these videos together. <laughs> My part as a composer in this uh, lecture. Um, as we could see, you work a lot um, also on stage with your pieces, as well as uh, Natasha is doing. But um, one thing that um, I was very interested. The first thing I got to know your work was actually when you uh, worked as a teacher together with a um, composition class in Frankfurt and you brought your composition class to Frankfurt and they made a piece together. And I was very impressed by the result as the usual outcome of so many people that learn to work as individuals and learn to express their own individual voice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really worked as one piece where you couldn't say um, which part was by whom or who did what part of um, um, ideas. And uh, I think that was actually a great success of that. And maybe I would be really be interested. How did you work with these people? How did you bring them to really actually work together? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and actually, uh, we did just another one uh, now with uh, musicians of Ensemble Modern and uh, students from Gießen and HTA uh, in Frankfurt uh, very recently. Um, and uh, a good colleague of mine, Philip Schulze, who organized that or organized my involvement in that, uh, we had a discussion at the beginning and I, I was saying, yeah, and you know, in an ideal world, we have 15, uh, uh, participants from you know university academies in an ideal world they make one piece where they really uh, you know they uh, they try to negotiate each other and uh, and ensemble modern and space and coronavirus <laughs> uh, uh, and he said yeah it's a nice idea but you know don't be too disappointed when it doesn't work um, and he didn't know and I didn't tell him that this had happened and worked once before. So I honestly, I don't a hundred percent know what it is. Maybe I have an inkling that there's sort of two things at play. One is that I absolutely place emphasis on process, uh, that the focus of all activity should be making uh, the thinking, the, the, the nits and bolts of the thing. And, and maybe what we end up with is like a, a signpost that, that points at that uh, good work we've done uh, rather than being the ultimate outcome um, and so I think it's a little bit that attitude 
And um, also, uh, I have a habit of giving people uh, very short uh, kind of text space or short tasks uh, in increasing sized groups uh, very rapidly at the beginning of a workshop. So everybody gets used to kind of having to spit out their quick ideas, negotiate something, put something together. And then as you keep extending those times from the first one of 15 minutes to uh, the last period was three days where they worked pretty much on their own. Um, these two times it managed to really continue and they made one, one piece. Um, That's, yeah. yeah, but I don't really know if I'm honest. I just try. <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, it was kind of impressive because usually you have these these pieces that uh, are then either by the by the timeline divided that everyone gets five minutes or seven minutes or whatever, or you have like overlappings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's very rare that everyone accepts to step back so much from their usual experience, and especially I think it's this, this is something in music where we are still trained to work as individuals and um, also not to give up our names, so to say. So it's kind of an advertising for our own creativity. But when you worked, I mean, you have a lot of um, different groups. Mostly it's only two people, <laughs> what I figured, um, and they all have names. But when you work together, is it kind of the same thing that you say, yes, we really go into process and start working with not too many ideas from the scratch and then really while working together, Uh, the piece um, results or evolves? Mm. It's very different every time, to be honest. I, I think that sometimes, uh, sometimes I get really super excited about an idea and then uh, I think, wow, I have to share this with uh, Michael or this one I need to share with Leander or uh, my, my other uh, collaboration with Mira Mashalski, also a, a duo. Um, you know, sometimes it feels right like that, or sometimes they're doing the same to me, saying, we have to make this piece about this in this way. Are you coming along for the ride? And it's like, okay, yeah, great. We make this a difficult listening piece now. Um, or sometimes we start with nothing or a brief or the piece from Tedious Work uh, with Leander Upchinski, which you saw. Uh, we were invited as artists to this festival, which was called Unfuck My Future, uh, learning to live or living together in Europe or how to live together in Europe. Sorry. Uh, so, you, I mean, <laughs> that's already the idea. What can you do against that? You don't. You, you, we were programmed the same night as Gob Squad. You have to do something with that. Uh, <laughs> and so in that case, we went, we bought a lot of children's toys and we uh, saw what we could do. So. I, I think it's different. I'm different in from day to day and with uh, with different people, different again. Um, it's not really fixed for me. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I was there live and I remember trying to create a tone through six or five or six recorders um, that were put together and it really took a lot of breath to do that, but <laughs> it managed to do a little bit. Um, Natasha, for you, I, I'm, I think that that's also something very interesting. You do work um, as a composer on your own, or at least it's your name on the composition and then other people are playing it. But also you are part of the um, Ensemble uh, Pamplemousse and where you work um, in a collaborative way. So maybe, um, I know it's, it's not, not something very clearly to distinguish, but would you say there is a difference that you can feel aesthetically um, from this different ways of working for yourself, so for, for your works that you could identify in some way? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, yeah, I, I mean, I've been thinking about that word kind of a lot over the last couple of years since it became, you know, a trendy word like collaboration. It's, I, I think it's interesting because I, I don't consider my my compositional work to be like 100% my own or um, not a collaboration because I don't really feel, I mean, the piece, I think this is, this is true of all composers, your piece isn't done unless an ensemble works on it and puts a lot of energy and thought into it and performs it with you. And I think that is a collaborative process as well. And it's, um, there's, I think that there's a little bit of this idea that musicians shouldn't or performers shouldn't contribute creatively to the creation of a work. And I definitely don't feel that way. Um, so when I work with ensembles, 
that are, you know, that I've been commissioned by or that I'm working with on a new piece, I still very much feel like it's a collaborative process. I'm writing the piece specifically for those performers. I expect and want them to contribute creatively um, to the to the creation of it. And I don't feel like the piece is completed unless, you know, unless there is that kind of dialogue. Um, but it is different with Pomplamos because we're, you know, this is like my my family, like we trust each other and we um, we really contribute more heavily to each other's pieces than than in that other situation. Um, but it's also, you know, we all still come uh, to rehearsals with some kind of structure or scores, ideas or whatever, and we develop those in workshop or sometimes they're completed works um, and we work on them together in that way. So. Pomplamus definitely feels like a collaborative ensemble because we're really working together actively and really creating the pieces as we go along. But it's also different from sometimes there's like this open collaborative process. And it sounds like this is a little bit more what Paul um, participates in where you just come and you create the thing from scratch, which, which is another great way of collaborating. Um, but I think that the word collaboration is like a very actually broad and um, mm. Uh, um, uh, what's that globby word? You know, it's <laughs> whatever this is. When, when you founded uh, Ensemble Pamplemousse, I mean, I mean uh, an ensemble uh, that that bears per se uh, a, a sort of collaboration. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be an ensemble. Uh, but um, did you think of a special form of uh, prospective uh, collaborations uh, you would like to realize within the ensemble when you founded uh, Pamplemousse, or uh, was it uh, on the fly and 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 within the work you did? that you said we have special uh, habits or manners of collaboration? Uh, I mean, I found it pamplemous like when I was a little, little girl, <laughs> like when I was, you know, <laughs> 20 years old. So um, when I founded the group, it was a very different creature and it became the group that it is now because of the people that mm. um, contributed to it. I mean, we all became composers simultaneously or not simultaneously, but we, you know, we all started composing around the same time. And that is very much like what kind of informed our process and our continuing process. Um, and now we have, so we have two additional members that, were, um, that weren't part of that initial um, compositional beginning process, but it still has informed the way that the group's voice has developed and the way that we continue to work. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where the identity um, of the group was uh was born but you are all uh composers and performers the the, the yes. whole group? Mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah i think that was um i think uh, what i said before was a little bit unprecise because exactly what you said there's always some kind of collaboration mm -hmm. um the importance is uh, lies in in how you uh, manage to work together how you realize some structure which is more or less hierarchical or um just uh, everybody's working more or less on the same level which also goes down to payment um uh, but also and this is um one important thing i think why we uh, uh, had the, uh, the the idea the need to talk about this especially in music um contexts where especially festivals are very much used to invite single names and if you say, okay, so we come as a collaborative, like um, Paul, you just mentioned Gob Squad, in the performance scene, it's pretty much the opposite, right? So there's very few people come with just one single name um, or just very few pieces are presented by one theater maker, I don't know the English word, or composer. <laughs> Usually it's, it's a team that, um, that feels responsible for the whole project and in our, um, seen i think it's pretty much the opposite even though we all know we do collaborate with others and we have to anyway so even if you write everything at home and you would say uh, your score is finished and there's nothing to be edited anymore still someone needs to play it and therefore needs to interpret it in a way um so it's the question would not be so much what's the difference between the performance uh, a collective or a singular work but more on the um and the openness you have in your pieces to um, to everything else that is involved in the process, which includes in the first place the other musicians, 
but also the space, the audience, um, the time, I don't know. Um, and I think that's that's also, I mean, Paul, you work, you do work a lot in different contexts, is that right? So also in contexts which are more performance-based uh, stuff. And I think one thing um, that struck me when I, when I listened to some other pieces of yours I haven't seen live is that um, there's some, um, the music is one element that is not necessarily played by professional musicians, but it can also be played very badly um, the same way when I saw uh, you and um, and Michael dancing and assuming you're not professional dancers. Um, <laughs> so there is this kind of, there's something at the foreground, which uh, for me at least, uh, the, the process of the piece itself is more important than the professionality of the um, specific media. And um, Maybe that is something typical for for collaborative pieces. I don't know. Mm. I mean, a lot of what you said, I uh, I totally agree with, um, except for uh, the final bit. Even though I said that the process is more is more important to me, and you're right, uh, the outcome still is is also uh, important. Um, and I think it's very easy to just be like, oh, yeah, I only care about the process, man, this is whatever. But actually, it's I really don't feel like that. Um, but I actually really, really enjoy this uh, more crunchy aesthetic of of working with uh, instruments that I can't play or working with. Uh, uh, recently, I've been painting and drawing a lot or uh, you saw in the uh, the first piece in, in the, the this is my <laughs> first and of, of only three goals at animating uh, for the first time uh, just to have a go at it and I, and I kind of like this um, I really enjoy the aesthetic of this um, something when I was really very young I, I realized that I really like is if if someone can say uh, anyone could have done that I always feel like yeah okay <laughs> uh, I must be on the right track if anybody could do it uh, uh, and so far people haven't quite then we must be this is like really i feel like it was always meant as a negative and i always saw it as a huge positive um yeah maybe that answers it a, a little yeah. bit sorry, sorry. I, you can hold your question okay because <laughs> <laughs> i think that the, what i meant with process is not the process before the piece but i think within the piece so it's very communicative uh, where the piece will be going so for example the um uh, the emoji piece uh, i forgot the whole title right now but it's very clear that you interpret and misinterpret different emojis and so i can so from the form that's it's not the, the process of the form is very clear and from that derive different materials or like different ways of interpreting like dancing moving sound that's that's why i, I didn't mean the process before yeah. um I, I was aware that the, it should be nice to enjoy also the piece itself <laughs> yeah no you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right i guess the the assumption is never uh what what sound can i turn this into yeah but, uh uh always what should this be uh should it be anything should i actually just be saying go look at that it's exciting mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah uh, um uh... <laughs> Just a second. With, uh, uh, with regards to this, uh, everybody could have done it. Um, it's uh, it just came uh, it came to mind um, a little bit, uh, sort of a musicological question. Do yourself do you consider yourself in in a sort of tradition with uh, especially uh, especially a British tradition? I was thinking of Cornelius Cardio and of the Scratch Orchestra and uh, things like that. Is is this uh, uh, quite a, a forming power of your, your work or has it uh, completely nothing to do with it? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I uh, studied a little bit with Howard Skempton mm. uh, during my uh, PhD, uh, who was just there doing it <laughs> with Cardio. Um, I always somehow anchored myself more with the fluxus artists mm. uh, and with the early conceptualists all the wit uh, I, I don't know why um, but 
uh, but yeah, of course. I mean, this kind of this kind of happenings thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, it matters uh, to me. I think it's still relevant somehow. Mm. Natasha, you had a question or a remark. I was just going to go back to the hierarchy thing because um, I think that's uh, you know that's like a. I thought that was an interesting point you raised, and I I think that Paul actually deals with that in a way that I think is really cool. And I think it is like a big responsibility of the composer or whatever to, to um, ensure that we do sort of kind of start pushing back against that idea that performers are just there to play composers pieces and that they don't get creative credit. Um, so I really like how Paul is always, you know, on all of his stuff, he always credits the people involved as full collaborators. And I try to do that also in my pieces. I, I, I do put my name on it, but I also, I say like, Natasha and Pompoulos or Natasha and Jack Quartet or whatever. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think that that is maybe, yeah, like I said, kind of our responsibility because I, I think it's one reason that at least like in this country, I don't, I think it's very different in Europe, but right now we have this very widening gap between performers and composers. And it's pretty interesting because we only have, most of our funding comes from academia. Um, for, for new music in, in this country. And so that exists almost entirely in the realm of the composers because there's very few academic positions for performers. Um, but the performers have all of the curational kind of power, although they were subject to the festival directors and all that stuff also. But so anyway, it's really interesting because there's this kind of constantly widening gap between curational resources and um, financial resources. And I think one of the driving forces behind that is exactly what you're talking about, this hierarchical system that we've um, allowed to develop over the course of many, 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 many years. But I think it's um, it's really because you mentioned that um, the hierarchy is, is um, because there are so many levels which are basically um, levels of power controlled over money. They're not so different in Europe, I think. It really depends on where are you going. If you go to classical concert halls, it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the kind of power is, um, there's first there's the conductors who get paid best, and then it's going down. Um, and it's very hard there as well to work as a group. And I think one thing what Paul mentioned, uh, which is, I think, very much related to this idea of, of um, um, breaking this hierarchy is this notion to say, if anybody could have done it, we're on a very good basic um, level for this piece, so we're on a good road, that means that um, you are invited to work in the piece it, it yourself. And um, I think, Natasha, in, in a lot of your pieces, I mean, you work, you not only work with video, like additionally, but the video, I mean, the, the, the bodies of the people very often um, disappear or are fragmented. There are only parts of them to see and here and that's also some kind of freedom you create to say it, it's not really important anymore to see this sportive um act of of playing an instruments where you can see that this person has trained for 20 years or so um because that's not at the foreground anymore it's not about artistic um um i'm missing the english word for it um <sighs> Wenn man so ganz, ganz schnell und virtuos, vir virtuous, it's actually the same in German, sorry. <laughs> if you play, vir so virtuosity is, is on a very different level uh, in both of your pieces than on the level as it is in the classic market. So what you're describing in, in the United States, Natasha, I think is not so far away here. I think it is further away in the performance scene where Paul's pieces are played as well. So especially the one, um, the, the Europe piece I've seen at the Mozartum in Frankfurt. And we're going to talk tomorrow with two, um, two um, groups from the performance scene from Swooshlieu and Herbert Mohren. Um, but do you see a way, Natasha, to break through these hierarchies, at least within your own work? So for example, do you, come to with work with Pampelmus, you sometimes just come with scratches, sketches or do you leave open space in the score or you cut out things again or you you work more personally with people or I don't know, there are other ways I can't think of. <laughs> I 
think that's that's a really interesting um, question because I, I think that there's often this idea that um, collaboration means that you have to get you have to ask like the performers have to come up with their own material. Um, and that's not I don't think that's the case at all. Some performers like to do that. Some performers don't like to do that. And that's that doesn't mean that they're not contributing creatively to it. You know, they they do contribute tremendously creatively to the act of interpreting or of learning music or of figuring out how to play the random shit that I wrote on paper, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not because they're not improvising or creating their own notes that they're not contributing creatively. So, I mean, I, I think that the way that I, um, well, the way that I write my pieces is really, like I said, with those performers, the performers that I'm working with in mind. So it's really different for each performer that I'm writing for. There's some, for example, when I work with Pomplum was, and I write something for Andrew, the drummer, like I know that he hates reading music and I know that he's a fantastic drummer and he has like all these incredible um, skills. And so I write the music in a way that makes sense for him. Or, you know, if it's like, like the piece, the piece for Darmstadt is actually like he only plays um, because the piece didn't really call for that kind of drum playing. So he's playing like something very limited. Um, so it really depends on the performer that I'm writing for how I feel like they're going to be most comfortable contributing to it. It's not necessarily like, I don't know, I, I feel like there's not a, a set of tools that I use in each piece that kind of allow for that process, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's a substantial uh, question anyways, if uh, there's uh, a demand or if there's a need to, to work uh, collaborative or uh, collective, because uh, if you, if you, for example, look at, at orchestras, uh, there's no need uh, <laughs> amongst the musicians uh, to work uh, collaborative with the composer or collective. They are uh, completely content if you give them uh, the, uh, was is stimmen, the, um, the parts, the parts uh and there's the conductor and they they play it um i think it's 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 um uh, part of this is, is surely the training uh, a musician gets where this idea of collectiveness or, or collaborate collaboration is quite quite alien to to a usual musical practice isn't it orchestras are maybe a slightly different Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Based, then I'm course, used to, yeah. I mean, I've only worked with an orchestra like once, but um, yeah, I, I mean, it's true that the larger the ensemble gets, the more unwieldy the that mm -hmm. sort of communication gets. And also, I mean, that's why, you know, that's another good point to bring up is just the time involved in open collaborations. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to openly collaborate, like Paul said, with 15 people, it's going to take a really long time to come up with anything, you know, at all, because it's just like just negotiating 15 individual people is, is really hard. Um, and even if you're just doing it with two people, it takes a lot longer than if you spend all this or it takes a lot of more time together than if you spend some time on your own to come up with some ideas and then you kind of mold those with the other people around you. I don't know, the time thing is I think really interesting because like the career thing interferes I think a lot of times with the time involved with collaboration. That didn't make any sense, mm -hmm. but maybe you know what I said. <laughs> well, definitely does. I think that's um, well, that's also a very crucial point to, to, um, to collaborations. Um, um a long time ago like a, a technician i worked uh, with together he told me that for him the problem to see collaborative pieces is that they always um need to communicate mm -hmm. within each other which results in his opinion i disagree strongly but i uh, i thought it's a, it's a point worth discussing he says there is no um um subjectivity which is just unanswered in these pieces anymore so you always when, when you do something and to work with someone else um you have to have some form of communication to others and i think it needs a lot of um open will from everyone to say okay i accept what you're doing without necessarily understand what you're doing if i do something just by myself i don't need to explain it to anyone not even to myself i can just do it and then 
either have the courage to open it to other ones and show it to other ones or don't. But at the moment you work with uh, more people, there are some ways of communication. So it's not only time. I think there's this other aspect in collaborative pieces um, where you need to somehow communicate or maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe you don't like Paul, when you work with, I mean, you work a lot with Michael. Um, do you sometimes just play without words together and then say, let's keep it like that? <laughs> uh, not like that, because I, <laughs> I don't really work without words. <laughs> um, so sometimes we do words without making any sound. Uh, that's, that's the thing. Um, yeah. I was sort of making notes as I was going on and now I've got far too much to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, I suppose uh, to, to kind of counter a little bit, oh, but hopefully in a, in a really, uh, in a friendly way, <laughs> Hannes, uh, that actually I don't see this big difference. Um, and actually it's part of a crucial thing, which I've realized recently, that I think I have to get ditched the, the me thing because it's, it's always, I'm always working with others and I always want to get to a stage where I can explain to someone, ah, this is the idea I'm thinking about and I'd really like to take this forward and I'm a, I'm a bit stuck. Uh, I always have a, another person from when I was a student, it was a teacher or now uh, at very least always a dramaturg uh, with me to, to bounce those things off. And then I sort of, I realized as you were saying that um, or, or a couple of things that even if I'm working on my own, there's not, I, I, maybe it's just me, but I'm not someone who will just like let it, oh yeah, this is what I want it to be. I'm, I'm asking myself, there's, a, there's an inner monologue with myself about, well, why am I doing this? What, what is it I'm trying to grasp here? And I either say that out loud or in my head or preferably to someone else. And then it's much quicker to keep going. Um, because I can just air this this stuff out and, and hear someone's uh, brush with it or reaction with it. Um, and so weirdly, I think my actual experience is I can tie myself in a knot, but when I uh, work with someone else, then uh, I can I can race uh, can really move much much more quickly. Um, and particularly. Uh, it's quick with Michael, but it's insanely quick with Leander. We, we've worked insanely quick. Uh, ah, there was one more thing, but I don't remember what it was. I could bounce off that. I, uh, I wanted to say, Hannes, that I, I, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Paul, except for the time thing. I, I don't know about faster. I guess I, I guess I can relate to the, to being faster when you're around other people, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to like that's actually been the thing that's been hardest for me this year is, you know, I've been spending way more time working completely in isolation and it's taken actually, yeah, Paul, I do agree. It's taken me way longer. Like something that would have taken me two weeks has taken me six months. And that seems crazy to me because mm -hmm. I just like, I was like, I don't know, is this good? I have no idea. Who cares? <laughs> you know? Um, and yeah, and the few opportunities that I've had to work with other people, like now I'm in this house with compliments and it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, I it's uh, it's really not very fun to exist with your own ideas and not have anybody to to um, to ask opinions about or just you know talk about it and disagree strongly with what they say you know what I mean like it's not like it's not like I have ideas and I'm like you need to tell me that this whatever you know what I mean it's uh yeah yeah no but thank you both I mean that's really um I guess it's really important to say that that there is not really a distinct difference between working alone as you're never really are alone and work within team uh, neither time-wise or explanationary wise I think um this is still an image a lot of people have from creating art that is a rather solitary um, situation where, especially in music, words can't go closely um, towards an explanation. And that is how one creates. I, I totally agree. And I always surround myself with other people when starting a project, even towards the point where I'm mostly out of it and everybody else is doing the specific concrete things um, that sound. And I just created 
the environment. And I feel very happy about that or did the last two, three projects actually. But um, I would be very much interested. I asked both of you before um, to look at each other's works. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, something live as you live on quite different parts in the world, um, but at least online. And I would be very interested um, if you have question towards each other um, about each other's work or methods to work or um, maybe just some statements uh, to say. I, haha, I beat you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Paul, I have really enjoyed getting to know your work. Um, it's uh, really tragic and funny and all the things I like about um, composition, I guess, or whatever we want to call it. Um, and I mean, this is a very generic question, but I'm actually really curious to hear more about your collaborative process, maybe on a specific work. Um, if you could take us through that a little bit, just to know like what that's like when you, so you work a lot with, um, with uh, Michael Walters and uh, Ollie Clark, is that how you say his name? Um, and I guess I was, I am really curious if you can pick one piece that you guys have worked on, maybe this, the spaceship piece. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it's called. Um, but yeah, I love that piece. And I am interested to know how you did that. Maybe just like the boring day-to-day -day kind of thing. I'm really interested. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite a fun one, actually and will expose a lot of interesting hierarchies, I guess. Uh, Michael uh, lives uh, next door to me. Um, and, uh, and we both work at the Conservatoire. Um, and yeah, we've collaborated for five years now and kind of retro uh, fit, uh, difficult listening, our name, which is uh, uh, joyfully stolen from Laurie Anderson, someone who we both admire. Um, and uh, that was the piece that we put a, uh, had an arts council application, uh, arts council are the, the kind of the big, the funding body, uh, in the UK who kind of give out, uh, pennies to artists, uh, at the point that the first lockdown, uh, happened and we got an email saying no one will look at your application. So, uh. So it not, wasn't rejected, it was downright kind of deleted. Uh, so this was kind of interesting. And so it was a real uh, black hole that we were in. And so we thought, okay, look, let's make something anyway. Uh, and uh, Michael has uh, for a little while now been um, uh, enjoying very much uh, time on stage and in his thinking as uh, a Raya Contata, uh, who is the, the main uh, theme, uh, lost in her spaceship, uh, searching for black holes. Um, but at that time, even though we were neighbors, it was really the rule that you had to, uh, you really had to stay in, uh, and everyone was super terrified. And I had a, uh, I think a like four week or five week old baby as well. So we were triple terrified. Um, <laughs> that we really stayed in our houses and, and only uh, spoke even through the wall. Um, and the first thing we tried for like three weeks was to find a way that we could play keyboards together. And I, now to this day, I have no idea why that was the, uh, the thing we felt we needed to do because we've never just sat down and played keyboards together. We've <laughs> never made it. In fact, now we actually have because when we could finally get back together, we decided let's do the piece where we just play keyboards together. <laughs> um, which is the piece, uh, stars out, lights out. Uh, but we, we worked kind of isolated actually. So it was, uh, and there was a no, no situation. So it was, uh, Michael wrote at some point saying, okay, here's a 23 minute, uh, incredibly slow waltz on a synthesizer. That's the structure of the piece. Um, uh, let's uh, put things on it. And so we took the idea of waltz and the black holes uh, and started making material um, until the point that we were allowed to meet in the garden. We met in the garden, we made post-it notes of all of our things. We put them in an order that we thought would be satisfying. Uh, 
a friend did Michael's makeup. We got uh, Ollie, who make, he's a filmmaker, uh, to do the filming. And then it was played in order. <laughs> it's kind of, it was, it was easy and it was uh, cheap and it was incredibly uh, fun uh, in a time of kind of mostly fear. Uh, so yeah, a, a kind of strange one that where had all of these things involved. Where did you shoot the video? Um, in a green screen. Like a studio? No, just like a, you know. Oh, just like a, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? That's, uh, yeah. Um, where, so you, you said that you never work without words. Um, do you free write your text or how, what do you, uh, do you make your text? I mean, it depends, I, I guess, a lot. Um, for some reason, I've got super much more interested in the idea of story recently. Uh, maybe I feel like I was trying to find something abstract with text for so long, and then I realized it's much more fun if you just say the words in the order that people understand, <laughs> uh, and uh, and then don't edit them. So just 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 actually try to make it really easy to understand. Um, and so I got really interested in this idea, uh, and so then it became much more about free writing and less about trying to find a process to adjust things actually just let let things be as they are um but i suppose when i uh, said that i don't work without text i mean there are works without text but i always want to be able to tell someone what i'm doing uh it, it with words uh I, i'm not really I just don't find myself excited by those moments where it's like inexplicable. I know that like sounds terrible. Um, and I think a lot of people are kind of want that, like desperately want to find that magic moment where I'm much more interested when I can say, yes, it's just these three things. They happen at the same time, great. Huh? Uh, and then if someone says, well, why one of them? And then if I have the situation to say, ah, yeah, shit. Um, cause I, and it delights me because I really like the idea that uh, someone or a performer on the occasional times I write for a performer where someone can say uh, that's a that notes a mistake. Uh, and they know <laughs> because it wouldn't be there <laughs> um, because it's a, it's a simple system that makes sense. Uh, and I, I really like the idea of that I can look back at pieces and go, yeah, shame, that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> but but OK, it happened. Uh, great yeah sorry did that answer any question <laughs> yeah know. no totally thank you yeah <laughs> yeah um so paul you probably have seen some of the videos uh, by natasha i don't know if yeah. you've seen anything live before um no i wish i wish i could see something live but uh yeah i i i saw the videos i, I reminded myself of them but actually i I'd, I'd seen quite a few before um there's uh, there's some certainly some fans at our institution, uh, so that's something something nice. And uh, actually, we've uh, been doing a research project about documenting uh, the non-sonic elements of music together with uh, Andy Ingemels, another composer friend, uh, and Michael, uh, and colleagues in uh, Frankfurt, Philip Schulter and Marcus Dross, uh, also Ollie Clark and Mira Mashalski, who I mentioned. Um, and actually, your work or bits of your work and your work with uh, with uh, Jesse Marino uh, came up within the conversation of that of a really unique, uh, a very specific, but something that really achieves that well to sort of capture or to demonstrate or document these non sonic elements of music. Um, that said, I had a look back and uh, it's you know what I think is really interesting or the thing that excites me most is that I feel like, uh, and this is gonna contradict everything that I just said about my own work, but like I can like grasp almost like the thing that was probably your, like the spark of your first idea where it's like, I know what I need to do. Uh, this needs to be a piece. And then this is kind of uh, dissolved and, and made into something uh, magical and interesting. But it's like, I can almost feel this like tendril all the way back to the idea. 
um, even if I couldn't describe exactly what it was. But there's something really exciting about that. And it, for me, it's maybe it's that thing that allows, because I wrote when I wrote this, uh, this, this uh, kind of little uh, thing, thinking I might need to just say it all in one go. I'd written this word juxtaposed and then immediately wrote, yeah, but it's definitely not juxtaposed because uh, <laughs> they don't go together, but you definitely couldn't, they're definitely not separate. So it's like something else. Um, and so I guess the, the question, the first question that comes to my mind is, well, is that true that I should <laughs> sense this <laughs> feeling? But if it is, you know, how do you maintain this kind of transparency in the pieces? I think it's incredibly uh, admirable to be able to achieve a sense of transparency to an idea in such complex work. Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I actually, when you were answering uh, my question to you, I was like, Oh, that's interesting. That's exactly the opposite of how I feel. Like I, I feel like I, I want to, um, or not the opposite, I guess the inverse, um, that I want to have very like specific actions happen that create these spaces of, of non-understanding. Um, and rather than like, um, being able to explain things. Um, yeah, I, uh, hmm. um, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, um, transparency is something I prioritize. It's true. Like I'm, I definitely, um, but I also feel like I kind of work in a slightly maximal way, like cluttering, especially in video, I like to work with a lot of layers. And um, I guess most recently in the projects that I've worked on this year, I've been kind of trying to tone that down a little bit and um, uh, yeah, I don't know, return to more basic material a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, I have no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> I'm at a loss. <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> well that's that's i mean that's an interesting point that you're um and i think that's not um i mean it's, it's rather often that you've that the, the outcome of what you what you're doing um appears to some people in a very clear way even though you were like wandering through so many different ways and have no idea of how this all ended um which kind of contradicts this this um thing what i said before um about this colleague that told me you always need in, in collaborations you always need to explain each other what to do um because um there is a way to do that but maybe there's also this this um acceptance of not understanding what's happening here um which can uh, lead to beautiful results or even lead to results where from someone else's perspective it's totally clear <laughs> what happened you just by yourself don't know that mm -hmm. yeah thanks Hannes that was a great answer to that question <laughs> I appreciate that <laughs> and you reminded me Hannes of what I uh, before wanted to say with this this point um I think it's it's also this word that I, I'm always frightened to say but it's actually it's about trust right um, so if I work on my own, I have to also check that I trust my own decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I work with someone else, then, you know, sometimes it's much easier just to actually trust them to just do it, you know, just to, that you trust that you're, you're, you're moving together. And so there's, there's maybe no need to agree uh, or to communicate uh, outside of the, the thing. But those collaborations are rare, I find. Um, so when you find people that you can work together without most of the work being how to work together. Uh, I, I tend to just hang on to those people and work with them uh, <laughs> as often as possible and do nothing else. Which probably is true to everything in the world as well. No, if you find some people you can trust, you should hold on to them <laughs> for as long as you can or it lasts. But I think it's not, um, it's not only um, within this personal contact. I think this is really something where and we didn't get to talk about this, but we definitely need to talk about this in other sec uh, sections because I guess we're pretty much um, the end of our time. But this idea so, yeah. of um, um, using artistic work to something that contradicts our um, 
rather individualistic concept um, within the capitalistic uh, logic of, of uh, our society is, I guess, becomes much more important than it feels in the first moment, because of course it's very playful and it's also nice also to have people um, to collaborate with, but this idea to trust others uh, and to think also this way and not the other way around, um, why would I do something if the other's not, if you think about, I don't know, discussions about paying taxes, for example, like where everybody was saying, ah, I cheat because everybody else is. Um, you would never do that in an artistic experience, well, maybe in, a, in an orchestra you would, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> not play accurately because who would hear it anyway, but not within a group where you work together. So I think this is something which comes towards a political, um, maybe it's not already a statement, but it's some active um, step towards a different, different perspective uh, to live together. Um, you had something on your heart for quite a while. I've, I have the tension. No, actually not. Oh. But, but just a question out of sheer curiosity. The, we saw that film with uh, Natasha's work and it began with this crane piece in Bergen at the Borealis Festival. I've been present there at the performance and I always ask myself, how did you synchronize those those cranes? Uh, have you written a sort of a crane operator score or uh, how did you manage that? Yeah, they had click tracks and um, click, really, they also, yeah, yeah. yeah, and they also had, um, well, they, they also wanted the written instructions. It was the text, text instructions. Um, but yeah, they were synchronized with, with click tracks. Yeah, those crane, I mean, they were, they were awesome. They were great. <laughs> um, also an interesting sort of collaboration with, uh, with crane operators, which is not, not quite, not quite often in the music scene anyway. Yeah, um, the, the guy that owns that company was actually an experimental music lover, so that really? worked out. Okay. Yeah, and I'm doing it again with with Nate, our ensemble, and it's uh, Peter's son's dad owns a crane company. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> random connections to crane mm -hmm. people around the world. <laughs> That's, that's that's a good thing. So thank you very much, both of thank you, you, for coming. Thank you, everyone else uh, who did see this whole video and for listening uh, to us. Uh, again, if you do have questions, please come by Friday, 4 p.m. Central European time, or write us an email under the email address you can find on this website. Um, Paul and Natasha will both be there to uh, answer your question or to contradict them or <laughs> just ask them back or whatever they um, achieve to do with that. Um, please stay here for another minute, Natasha and Paul. Um, thank you all again. Tomorrow there will be a video together with uh, Herbert Morn and Katharina Pelosi from Swoosh Liu, and there will be a third one with Jennifer Walsh and Andrea Neumann. So um, yes, I hope you enjoyed it and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.